please welcome Serenity as one of our speakers for the first uh, workshop uh, in our region of Africa and Middle East. He is a threat intelligence strategist in the social team in Google, and he will talk about modern hunting. My to you. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me for this session. It's, a, it's an honor. Uh, so I, I will just share my screen uh, so I can start sharing my slides. All right, so today we want to talk a little bit about threat hunting. Uh, what I want to do during this session, I will show you and I will discuss with you some ideas, some techniques that we should be using as threat hunters. And at the same time, we will do some demos. We will try to do this in a more realistic way. So I hope this will be interesting. So let's get it started. Uh, first of all, uh, as uh, uh, Angad introduced me, I'm Vicente Diaz. I'm from Virus Total team inside of Google. And in case that you're not familiar with Virus Total, is uh, basically a threat intelligence uh, platform where you can find more than 15, 16 years of uh, malware from millions of users all around the world. So this information is really relevant in order for us uh, to be able to take a decision in, in terms of threat, threat intelligence, and especially in terms of threat hunting. This is a platform that will allow us to do all of our threat hunting in one single place in order to detect and to monitor any malicious activity. Uh, so if you want to know more about this, as well, to biostotal.com. All right, so let's just start why we need threat hunting and what is it? Uh, basically, we do threat hunting in order to get as much information as possible based in, in a set of uh, malware activity that we have. This can be like some indicators from some incident response uh, or for, from some forensic analysis. Uh, this can be simply that we want to know more about something that we saw in some uh, publication from any third party, or we simply want to find a way to find new undetected threats. So anyway, what is this giving us is all the context that we need. Let's say we have an alert uh, in our uh, CM and we want to, to put it uh, into context. We, know, we want to know how relevant this is if we want to keep investigating or if we can happily not. So getting this context is really relevant for us in order to prioritize where to put our limited attention. Uh, what is important to consider is that these days we are talking about threat intelligence, like from a very marketing perspective, let's say, uh, where everybody is selling uh, threat intelligence. But at the same time, we need to consider that intelligence is nothing that we can buy. So uh, what we can do is we can get the data that we need in order to use it with the tools, the needed tools in order to make the right decision. Uh, the right decision depends in our context and depends in our goals. So some of the things that we need to consider as threat intel analysts is first of all, that the more data we have is not necessarily the better. We need to have relevant data and at some point if we have too much of this data, this can be a problem. This is noise and this is very expensive and really difficult to work with. Second thing is that we all have partial visibility and this is really relevant because sometimes, uh, well, different vendors have like different alias for actors or uh, they see one part of what is happening, but nobody knows like the full extent of a campaign. So sometimes we are discarding something like, hey, this is only affecting this country, but we don't have full visibility. That's why it's important to keep that in mind and not make decisions just based in some partial analysis. And the third thing is the lack of context. Uh, no matter how good is our organization, we, we need the most, uh, the, as much context as possible in order to take a decision. And we don't have all telemetry. We don't have all the details. And maybe this attack already happened to someone else. And we want to know uh, from this someone else, what details they can share with us in order for us to remediate and to prevent. All right, this is a very important slide uh, because this basically is telling us that when we are uh, investigating any activity, we shouldn't stop 
just at the moment that we uh, discover the activity or at the moment that we finish our analysis. Because the campaigns, they keep going on. And let's say today we find some nice publication. And in this publication, we get some details and some indicators of compromise, right? Uh, we develop this in our systems in order to prevent being infected. The thing is that this campaign, uh, if it is still alive, it can be evolving and it can be changing in terms of technical details, indicators, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to keep monitoring. And this is one of the most uh, interesting and proactive actions that we can take in order to make uh, threat intelligence uh, something we can leverage as defenders. So do not limit yourself just to get a bunch of indicators and throw them into whatever uh, defensive system. My recommendation is to do, in this case, this hunting, but to keep doing the hunting during all the process. So basically you keep monitoring any new activity and if something new happens, you will be ready. So this is another aspect of monitoring, uh, sorry, of threat uh, hunting. All right, uh, having said all of this, let's go into something, let's say a little bit more uh, technical or a little bit more um, practical. And we will start with a string based searches. So what is this? It means that uh, many times when we're having some samples, the first thing that we want to do is to take a look if we find something that is unique and if this whatever is unique is enough for us to find other samples, other artifacts, other elements from this campaign. And we will see that with a few examples. But before we start, uh, we can say also that, at least in the case of uh, Biostodal, we are leveraging all the wisdom of the crowds. And uh, that's why our platform is crowdsource intelligence provider, because we get all this information, we aggregate from all the different millions of users that we have. And also we aggregate OSINT data. Uh, we try to provide some context to what's going on. So sometimes, uh, we will see this later in the examples, we are looking for some sample, we are checking something, and we already have some inf information, some investigation that the community did for us, uh, making our life easier. So this is, again, the best case scenario where we need to do nothing. We want to get some context about something, and we can see immediately. But Obviously, we always need to take with a pinch of salt, especially in the most complicated cases, because we need to make sure that there are like no human mistakes or no errors or not whatever. Um, anyways, um, I think what I'm going to, uh, I, I will directly go and show you into the platform. I think it will be easier. But basically, what we do in Barusota, also with all the information we have with every single sample, is we put as, as much as possible, as much as we know. We basically, uh, through the sample, through some boxes, through antivirus verdicts, uh, through different security tools, we get extract the metadata. And we also extract all the content. So you can search in binary, or you can search in uh, ASCII or Unicode, and you can find whatever is interesting inside. And I want to show you some example where this is something we can do. And actually, this is something I was doing this morning because I was uh, checking about um, some research from our colleagues from Palo Alto. And in this research, uh, which is about this ransomware, it's called Mespinosa. Maybe you heard about it, it's a pretty, uh, a uh, big operation uh, for the last year or so. So I will directly go into the indicators of compromise because I'm interested in Mespinosa ransomware samples. And I want to show you some of the things we can do with that. So you can see here at the end, we have a couple of samples from Mespinosa, which is enough. So I will simply copy these two hashes and I will search in various stores. So the first thing is that we already see that this is belonging to this collection by Motivia, this Mespinosa collection. So we already have some contextual information. Uh, as we were discussing, there are already some crossovers, there are rules that are saying that, yeah, this is Mespinosa uh, or this uh, PISA, which is another name for this ransomware. But 
it doesn't matter. I mean, this is what we were discussing before about the context. We, do, we don't really need to do much uh, here to understand what this is, right? But what I wanted to show you, uh, we were talking about content and content is what is inside of the malware. So here we can see uh, the typical, you know, uh, uh, insights of, of some malware. One interesting thing about this Mespinosa is that at least in some of the, uh, the samples that I have seen, uh, I haven't checked like you know all of them, of course, but uh, check this. So basically, there are like some uh, the the ransom message is inside of the malware, and actually it is visible. It is not encrypted. It is it is not obfuscated. It is no nothing. So you can see here, hi company, every byte on any types of your devices was encrypted. Don't try to use backups because you were encrypted to blah, 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 blah. So this is the typical ransomware message, right? Uh, back to what we are going to, what we wanted to explain here is that inside of Arisoto, we can use this content modifier for absolutely anything. So if we see something like that, this is a very good um, place to start because this is pretty unique. Uh, so basically with this modifier, we can go and search for this string, this every byte on any dice of your devices was encrypted, which, because this is part of the ransomware message. So it's very likely that other samples of Mespinosa also implement this, and it's very unlikely that we find this anywhere else. So um, just by clicking on it, we already do this content search. Uh, if you remember, this is the content modifier we were discussing here, content search modifier. Basically, we are looking inside of our, of our collection, any malware with this content. Uh, this content here is in hex, uh, but it works, it works the same if we put like, you know, in ASCII. It's just like it is implemented. Anyways, uh, so here we find a bunch of samples. Uh, there is one thing though, is that here you can see we have access and TXT. Uh, why? Because, well, th this is an ASCII stream, so it can be anywhere. So I, I want just to make sure that we only get executables. And uh, I will put type TXC. And actually, we can also do first in, in 2021 June. So just to find some recent samples of this machine also. But you see, with this content, yes, with this stream that we found, um, this is very useful and um, it's helping us to detect uh, any malware uh, from this family feed, this family that we found here. Actually, uh, maybe even, you know, these different uh, 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 email addresses they, we can use for that, but I think they, they keep changing from sample to sample, so maybe this is not so interesting. Okay, let's give it a bit of time because all the content related when you put more modifiers, it's a bit slow. Oh, sorry, uh, we got here the details. So we got four samples uh, for this Mespinosa collection. And again, we are basically just searching for one stream. The thing is that in this case, it's a good stream. And how we know if this is Mespinosa or not? Well, they look like, right? They have the same size, more or less. Uh, they were first seen well, uh, around the same time, and uh, actually we can check like the same year rules. This Mespinosa are also fine here. And uh, even inside of the verdicts, we see Mespinosa. So it looks like they are related. So this is basically how this content search modifier works. Um, uh, that's why I was saying that probably it's easier just to show with one example. Uh, if you're interested, how is this working inside? Uh, well, basically, this is this index of every 32 bit substrings uh, inside of the samples that we have. And as it says here, this is great for prototyping retro hands. Uh, we will go into hands and retro hands and things like that later. But this is true because you can find like something that you suspect, like we were suspecting, hey, maybe this uh, string is good for doing some search, which uh, according to results, it looks like. So we can consider using like a YAR rule using this string. So in case that we are not sure, we can quickly search and see what we get. 
Um, so another good example is about PDBs. In this case, you can see uh, here in this sample for whatever reason, when they compile the project, uh, well, you know that you have some meta information. So here you have the PDB where it was a store. And usually this uh, path, uh, this local path is quite, uh, is quite unique. So in case that you have some more polymorphic samples, for instance, or you are like creating all your malware in the same place, well, these kind of things are very, very useful. So this is another great example how we can use this for finding uh, more malware. I think this is from TrickyBot or something like that. Uh, what else we can use? For instance, encryption keys or some commands from some malware that they are unique and things like that. Also, in some occasions, metadata. So all these kind of strings are really useful for us to find like more stuff related, not necessarily exactly the same, but related. So these kind of clues are great when you start some investigation. Um, just, it, it doesn't mean that any of them will be like the final one that will uncover the whole thing, but accumulating them is great. And usually uh, it's a great thing also to have like a bit of here and there, and you can use for different conditions like in Yara rules, uh, which we will see later. Um, in this case, you can see here in the content by searching, you don't need to put in, in, in hexa, you simply put in ASCII, the whole thing, which is also working. And one trick that you can do is that you can make this a little bit more flexible, for instance, like using wildcards uh, in this case. Uh, let's say that you have this my project in a different uh, in a different unit. So instead of D, it could be, I don't know, C. Uh, so you can also use something like that. So what happens when you search for a string without the content modifier? Because this is something you can also do in Baristotle. In reality, you don't need to use the content. You will search for anything and we will return the results. The thing is that internally, basically, these are like different indexes. So inside of the content, if you want to specifically search inside of the content, uh, just use the content modifier. Uh, just because otherwise you will also search like in the metadata, in the output from some other tools that we use in Baristotle for analyzing the malware, et cetera, et cetera. So it's better to be a little bit more specific. And with Prota, uh, sorry, and with the content modifier, you can use also different additional um, well, modifiers, uh, like size, type, per scene, last scene, in hash. Actually, we, we've seen that. Uh, we were using the type for PXE, and we were using uh, first thing just to, to make the condition a bit more accurate. But in reality, um, you cannot use the whole list of modifiers with content. Uh, at this moment, just a few are available. So if you are ever curious which ones, you can see here. Well, you can also see in the, in the documentation, but it's better to be aware. All right, uh, so this is the first thing we can do. So we have some sample and we can search uh, based on what is inside of the sample. In this case, some good string. But what else can we do? Uh, so there is another case. Let's say we have a bunch of samples and we want to start our hunting. But this, these samples are unique per victim, which is also something that happens because uh, actually it's an OPSEC uh, measure for attackers. So they cannot be related to other attacks and it's uh, a bit more difficult to find some other stuff from them. Uh, the thing is that even if you do so, um, it is unlikely that you change absolutely everything. Uh, first of all, like the people who is coding, uh, also the frameworks, the libraries, um, Usually you are reusing as much as possible simply because it's, it's um, well, it makes sense, right? Um, it's saving some budget and some time. And if something is working, why well, you need to rework it from scratch? It doesn't make sense, right? So usually uh, you want to leverage this in order to find something that looks like the same, something that is similar. And, and here is where we are going to talk about similarity. So what is similarity? Basically, if I share with you two samples and I ask you, hey, are these samples, uh, are these two samples similar or not? Well, uh, the answer is not easy uh, because you have many, many criterias 
to say if they are similar or not. Maybe they look similar in the outside, like they have the same sections, the same entry point, the same size, uh, maybe they have the same metadata, or maybe they share big pieces of code between them. Maybe they have the same imports, exports. Uh, maybe they execute and they have the same, very, the same uh, behavior. So there are like many different criteria to define if two different samples are similar. Uh, so what to use? It really depends. Um, there are many algorithms created by uh, very smart researchers and you can use them in many different situations. And depending on your, uh, on your goal, you can use one or the other. Like there are some algorithms that work well with an OP exe. Some algorithms are working better with uh, Linux files. Some of them are providing you with different possibilities. So, Let's take a look at um, what kind of stuff we can do. Uh, here I have like some examples for you. Uh, and I will start with visual similarity. And uh, here is the reason. Visual similarity is great just because, um, because it's very easy to understand. So let's say we have this file. In this case, this is a PDF and this was used in some campaign to distribute some malware. Uh, actually, this was an attachment. So let's take a look to the inside. Yes, wait a second. Uh, let me kill this, all right. Let's take a look to how it looks like. In this case, being a PDF, we can do a preview, which obviously does not make sense in a uh, PXE, for instance. So here we have typical uh, phishing message uh we have temporarily suspended your city bank account all right so let's say that we are worried about this maybe we are city bank maybe we are someone else it doesn't matter uh and we want to find more once again we are in this threat hunting process so we want to find like how big is this how many banks are affected uh what kind of malware this is distributing um should they be worried or not this kind of thing so what is the first step to find more of those? Uh, and here is what I wanted to show you. Uh, you can see here this icon. This is for visual similarity. Actually, here there are like all the different uh, similarity algorithms uh, that this obviously changes depending on the file, and we will see later. So let's just start here with visual similarity. So by clicking here, uh, we already found like 40 files uh, similar to the ones that that we have seen. And actually here you can see a, a visualization, very small one, of course, but they look like the same. So let's check the first one we have here and let's check the content. And again, we go to preview. Here we have something that looks exactly the same, but instead of Citibank is Wells Fargo. So your, your, your Wells Fargo account has been suspended, which is the same. So this visual similarity works with things that are visual. For instance, um, with some PDF, like in this case, uh, Microsoft Office document too, or for instance, with the icon that some malware is using. In some cases, this is also interesting. So this is like the first thing we can use uh, for similarity. So I want to show you also uh, well, I think here I have another example. Yes, this is indeed. This is one file. Um, actually, let's 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 just go here into community and see what people say about this file. Sorry, let me kill this again. And here we can see uh, this malware is tagged as Severity. Uh, if you're not familiar with this, this is um, malware from one FT group. Actually, this server C, uh, well, actually there is here like a full explanation, I think, from some alert. Uh, implant to target victims in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, all right. So what we want to do here is to find maybe some similar files. And here, I, I just want to show you, there is something we can do. Uh, we can search for all the different algorithms. Uh, 
you know, this is kind of brute forcing. But why not? Let's say we have no idea. Yes, let me kill um, the other tabs just for clarity. And this one, uh, whatever. So here uh, we are searching for similarity in this case using many different algorithms. And we will see which ones are providing us like with good results and which ones are not. Yes. Sorry, I want to kill this extension. Unfortunately, it's been opened by default. So we can see clearly everything in the screen. All right. So here is where we did the search. Now, this is the first method we use. So this is called similar to internally. Basically, this is an internal algorithm that we created. And here, uh, from the original file, which was this 0BE, and we can see here 0 B. obviously, uh, you find it similar to itself. We have a couple of more files. And here you can see the size is the same. And actually, first scene is around the same date. Actually, this one is first seen almost immediately at the same time. So if we take a look here, let's see if we are lacking community. Yeah, there we go. We have another reference to Severus. Uh, it doesn't mean if we don't find an external reference that is not related, obviously. This one, for instance, uh, here we don't have any comment. Uh, so we don't know for sure if this is Severus or not. We will need we will need to, to check in more detail. But actually, we will need to take a, a second look. But we already found like a couple of more samples. This one uh, is called similar to. We are trying to search something similar by code. In this case, this is finding nothing. This is our original sample, so we will kill it. And this is searching by imhash. You know that all the samples, they have some imports. You create the hash with the imports. This necessarily, that, it doesn't mean necessarily that they are the same by having the same imhash. One thing we can do is we can search here uh, of properties that they have in common if we want. Uh, we can take a look. So all of them, they share the same imhash. And all of them have the same entry point, which is interesting. So well, we will need to take a look to all of them and, and see if they are related or not. In this case, this says Baba, like, but this one is the one we saw before that was several C. So some detections maybe are uh, a bit misleading. Uh, this one is also several C. Oh, of course, this is the one we originally saw. Well, I don't want to waste all the time here with this. This is still hash, another algorithm finding much more uh, SSD. This is very traditional. Everybody knows and loves or not <laughs> this uh, SSD. In this case, 72% similarity. I think maybe these two samples are the first ones we saw in the first one. Uh, B hash. This is interesting. Uh, B hash is behavior hash. So it means that inside of the sandbox, they behave the same. But maybe they are doing nothing. But, uh, here's, this is VHash with another sandbox. Uh, 8 million results of the story. VHash with another sample, 3.6. So we have your hashes. Uh, you see they are a bit more tricky, uh, depending on the sample. Uh, for some of them, it may be better. Uh, this behavioral hash is much more accurate, but this epiconfig.exe, I'm pretty sure this is totally unrelated. And finally, another vhash. So all these behavioral hashes trying to detect what behaves like the same, but SSD is still hash, maybe too many samples. Imhash, well, this is something to consider maybe, uh, similar to definitely working well. So you see, we can use like different methods depending on what we want to achieve. All right, uh, so we, I hope we got a clear idea of what we are doing with similarity. Um, actually, I have here a longer example, but I think we will skip just for the sake of going through the whole presentation. Uh, obviously we can limit this with this similar to 
uh, we can have like different modifiers uh, in order to search for something a little bit more specific. Uh, actually, this one was pretty nice. Just let me show you the final result. This is about TrickBot. And let's say we want to, to find like some uh, network indicator. So from the whole similar tool, we can go to the ones that have behavior network. And this way is, uh, we can search for uh, the infrastructure that they are using or they are using if, if we want, for instance, just to develop some protection. But well, uh, again, in terms of similarity, I hope more or less the idea is clear. So uh, my recommendation about similarity will be use it, but you have seen that depending on the sample, we have better or, or worse results depending on the sample family. And you have seen like different algorithms, they are producing many different results. So always, of course, uh, consider similarity, but feel free to discard. I mean, something similar to another sample, it doesn't mean that they are necessarily the same family, but when you have nothing else, this is great in order to find more artifacts and, and to find something that may be related. All right, so let's move on and let's check some related artifacts and infrastructure. And here, uh, basically, there are like different methods we do this in VirusTotal, but obviously, in, well, if you want to use your own, uh, you can use it, use them as well. Uh, in different platforms, there are different ways to do that. But here, basically, we try to detonate in the sandbox. Uh, but also we check what is inside of the domain, uh, of, the, of the sample. So we try to find everything we can inside of the sample that looks like a domain, like an IP. Uh, we identify this. We also check whatever happened during dynamic analysis. And then we keep accumulating this information. So if we see that something uh, is communicating with some IP domain, this is one way but uh, the other way around, we can also see if some domain is downloading something malicious, if it did in the past, uh, if there is some IP used for distribution of malware, et cetera, et cetera. So this is making life easier when we are like finding some infrastructure related to any threat, because we see quickly what is the infrastructure, uh, we see if there is anything else from that. So we can keep expanding the investigation pretty easily. Uh, for instance, in this case, uh, this was detonated in the sandbox. So we see here this URL that was used by the attackers. Uh, there is another thing though, uh, that sometimes these URLs, uh, you can see some pattern, like here is totally random path that they are using, right? But in some cases you can find it shorter, like both config and things like that. So this is great just to find um, something that, uh, could be used in the same path because you can just take the path, search for it in various total and see if there is any infrastructure being used like uh, conducting with this path. Uh, and you can see we have also a verdicts about the URLs and the IPs. In this case, this is from uh, all antiviruses. Uh, if at some point they have seen this IP or this URL serving something malicious. So this can also give you an idea if something might be suspicious or not. And actually, uh, as I said, um, we will see later how it looks like uh, in a graph, but basically you, you can drop quickly and see the infrastructure that any sample set is contacting to. Uh, here we can see like everything, right? So from one side we have, this is the, uh, in this case, the URL that is contacting. This is one thing. But we also are checking for something embed here. And here we find embed one Gmail account. So this email account may have been used, I don't know, like the ones we have seen before from Mespinosa to send the, the ransom. Uh, at the same time, we have this uh, icon that is indicating that this was distributed in the wild meaning that this sample, this malware, malicious document, at some point was seen being distributed through the different, uh, these different URLs, which is great because we can simply go into this URL and click and see if there is anything else from there. Um, 
But then you can simply pivot on the infrastructure and you can go and see this um, IPs that we were using for dropping malware. And from here, you can see if any other malware was even being dropped from here too. And you see this long list of executables. So this way you can identify the infrastructure that in most of the cases is helping you uh, not only for the investigation, but to pivot and to understand what other artifacts you can obtain. Um, so I want to show you this. I want to show you this, but I want to show you with this graph, which is the previous thing that we saw. And this is helping us take time to do an investigation. So I think we will go directly into the example. Uh, here we are talking about PP graph. What is it? It's a visualization tool. Uh, but you already saw it. So let's go into some cool thing. So for instance, here I have like this search. Let me kill previous tabs just for the sake of clarity. So what is this? Let's see some document with 10 or more positives and at least three sources. So it's quite like common having macros and first thing let's put I don't know since yeah uh, since June so we have like 12 different files here um, so let's take a quick look to what we have here uh, you know what I was thinking Let's do that, but I was thinking it will be cool to continue with the same example we, we watch, the one from uh, uh, Mespinosa. So uh, I will be opening this, but I want to continue with this example and it's maybe more interesting. So let's go back to the indicators of compromise, which were at the very bottom. There we go. And I wanted to start with this nice thing also. So yeah, we have here this nice graph uh, from everything we found before. So yes, let me show you. So here you see like different, oops, sorry, different, different things. So on one side, you see some of them, it says good note. Root node means that these are the ones we were uh, obtaining. We just got from the from the search. And here you see like the communication, like these root nodes. They are communicating to these IPs from one side. Let me just try to separate a little bit so we can see a bit clearer. And here you have this similarity, if you remember. So also from every root node, you see there are like some similar files. Maybe these documents were also interesting for the investigation. They are also malicious, like here. You can see this is malicious. This is related to this. This is also malicious. It's similar to this, et cetera, et cetera. So we can find immediately like a lot of infrastructure uh, and a lot of similar files if we want to continue this investigation. So this is one thing. Another thing we have is you see this icon, right? this is a small box. This is for bundled files. Uh, now, uh, if you know all the document files, .x files, in, in reality, there are like a zip file. And inside they have like different files, like these XMLs and everything to find the format of the file, the content. Then you have this doc file. And more interestingly, then you have this BBA. So you can see here, like different BBAs. Let's put them here, like a little closer, all of them. So what does it mean? It means that inside of this document that is malicious, there is the template, there is the content and everything. But then some of them, they have this macro, which is the BBA. So the macros are very interesting because in reality, 
this is the malicious code that then the malware is executing once that it's open in the document. So let's take a look maybe to some of them. And if, there are like different ways to do that. So let's say, I don't know this one, just, I don't know, just because. Uh, let's take a look in various.out first. And here, uh, you know, it's very cool because for macros, we can simply go into content and we can see what they are doing. So you see this one is auto open and then is concatenating this calc xc to execute with like a, a shell script. So this is opening basically the, the calc calculator. So this one, we, we can check if maybe it's like more malicious or not, but in principle, it doesn't look that interesting, right? So maybe we can simply delete this. We are not interested in this one, but I don't know. Let's take a look into this another one. Uh, again, we can go into content. Oh, sorry for that. And this one looks a little bit more suspicious, right? So, um, well, here, this looks worse. Um, macro contain two, two, ten. Hmm. This one looks much more suspicious, but I wanted to see in more detail. Anyways, uh, let's say we have this in our graphic and we want to further investigate. So what we can do is just double click and we will find all the relationships we have in virus total. One of them is similar to, as you know, another one are like the compressed parents. It means that this file, this VBA can be found also in all these documents. So if we think this is malicious, here we have like many more documents to continue our investigation, which are not in the initial collection of the ones we found. And also we can find all these similar PBA files. It means that they look, well, we already discussed about similarity. And from here, we could continue the investigation. So you can see inside is the same. And from here, we can also check like double click. And again, here we have another document that looks suspicious. And actually one thing we can do is we can select all these documents and see what they have in common. So for instance, the author is like this is strange thingy, creation date time, similar to them. All of them are writing files, opening files. Well, maybe from here we can go <clears throat> and use, for instance, this office author name to find inside of the metadata. So different possibilities. Um, let's take a look into this mess you know, setting game or oh, just very quick. Um, so let's kill this two. Let's kill this graph again. And let's do something similar to what we did. In this case, we are starting with only one sample, which we are going to open. So what do we have for this? First of all, <clears throat> we have it is the uh, dropping something, but none of this looks malicious. And uh, well, to be honest, being a ransomware, I'm not surprised. And if you don't mind, I'm going to kill this. Um, so here we have two things. This is a node we are investigating. From one side, we have a lot of similar nodes, which is great. So we can use this to continue our investigation. From the other, and this is very interesting, we find that it's embedding two domains, proton mail and onion mail. Why is that? Uh, if you remember when we saw before the ransom message, uh, well, actually we can check again, so no need to remember anything. But from the ransom message <clears throat> inside, 
the malware, uh, they were asking here, you see, to send your data to Onion Mail and Proton Mail. So this would be an interesting indicator of compromise. So we can simply extend this relationship. Um, all right. So in this case, send them nothing. All right. Um, I'm curious about extending from other files. Uh -huh. So from other files, uh, what we can see is the same, uh, but in this case, well, similarities and everything, okay. But in this case, this one is only contacting proton mail, not onion mail as well. Uh, so maybe they are changing this. Uh, let's take a look instead of a ransom. Let's quickly. Uh -huh. So they are changing that. While King of the Jungle, Proton Mail, and Pink Sky Planet, Plane, Proton Mail. Uh, so that's why. So you see, um, basically with Graph, we can very quickly figure out things. We just need to keep double clicking in whatever we want to expand and just selecting what is interesting for us and what is not. And, and that's it. This one actually is also interesting. Like, look, these are the compressed parents. So this was in all these files, but this is called ransomware, master, whatever. So what? it simply looks like somebody uploaded like this to Biostopper. In some cases, like if this is like another name, it, it may look like this was distributed like an attachment or something. All right. Um, anyways, in terms of showing how graph work, I think this is uh, more or less, I hope this is more or less understandable. Uh, basically, the idea is that sometimes, you know, when you have a list of files, it's not the same than having something you can work with, like here, and you can move around things, and you can tag, and you can change names, and I don't know, you, you can see things like in a different in a different way. So this way is making your life much easier as researchers in order to do some investigation. But well, this is my demo of graph. So let's move on a little bit. Uh, yes, not to key all the time. Oh, sorry. So next, I want to discuss a little bit about some tools for hunting. And in this case, uh, the, the queen of tools, let's say, is Yara. If you're not familiar with Yara and uh, you're interested in threat hunting, uh, my recommendation is to please uh, spend some time getting familiar with it because this is one of the most flexible and useful tools uh, for doing all kind of uh, threat hunting and monitoring. So if you are not familiar with it, this is how a Yara rule looks like, um, very quick. This is from NCSC uh, from the UK. And in this case, they are describing some malware that they found. What you can do with Yara is you create rules and these rules can be used for detection. Basically, think about this like a super grid. You're looking for something inside of a collection of malware and you want to find which ones of these files are uh, fulfilling the, the, the different conditions in your rule. So here you have some metadata with everything related to this rule. What is it, what hash it is based on, what is the reference, the family of the malware, etc. And then you have the strings and conditions. So usually the condition is a combination of the strings and some other stuff. But basically you want to look for these strings inside of the malware. And then you do some logical uh, uh, decisions around this. So from one side, well, we want this to be executable. You want to check the headers. Uh, and you want .NET magic, basically meaning that this is a file uh, in .NET. And then you want two of the other S conditions, which are these four. So basically, if you find two of those, and this is .NET, um, this rule will match. So if you are confident that this is enough for finding what you want, uh, then you are good to go. The thing is that you can create rules that are 
not so specific, or you can create rules that are a little bit more flexible just for the sake of finding something that you don't know. Actually, you can create a rule based on nothing, just based on your idea of what would be interesting to find, what kind of malware we are missing, or even you can find some file properties that do not match. Let's say inside of, uh, if you go into your Windows, System32, and you see what is in there, you can search for similar files having like some differences. And this will be suspicious for sure. All right, so let's go here with some quick example. Uh, this one, I, I want to make it really, really quick. Um, let me kill the other tabs. So what is that? Um, oh, sorry. Uh, I, I was searching again for the same. What, what I did here is basically I'm searching for the results. Uh, I, I will just show you. So again, uh, this is a Ryo example, which is a ransomware. So you can see that here, this is detected by some crowdsource YAR rule, meaning that um, well, it's matching this YAR rule. And actually we can search for other files that are matching this jar rule, this jar rule in our collection. So you can find other samples, right? So this is basically uh, what we were doing here. In this case, the only condition is that we are just searching for the ones first seen uh, since May. So they are a bit fresher. Uh, one thing we can do to start with is take a look to the jar rule. So just to make sure if this is something that makes sense to us, if this is something that we can trust. So we can always take a look to the source. And this is what I highly recommend. So here is like searching for these five strings with one of them, we're good to go. And then we have a couple of imp hashes, like they are using either one or the other, or uh, one of these conditions. So this is all we need to detect uh, right examples. All right. So here, uh, here we have uh, the samples and we want to create a YAR rule. So you know what we can do? We can create our own rule. And here we have a very cool tool. The, let's say we have no idea about this. We have the samples. And we want to take a look how we can quickly create a YAR rule. So this is called btdiff. Um, so for btdiff, basically what we are going to do is we are going to take these samples and we are going to to see what they have in common and what differences they have uh, this is similar to other um, generators of jar rules for instance there is one that is called jargen uh, by florian roth which works pretty well is but in this case it's based on the strings uh, in our case we are going to search for it uh, we are going to to search for the differences not in the strings but in, in code blocks. So this way, uh, we're going to do something that for a human is very hard, which, which is finding which parts of the code are similar or, or are the same between all the samples. And we can use this to create our YAR rule, which will make our life a bit easier. My recommendation in general is uh, that these generators, they work pretty well, um, but never just fully trust this automatically. I, I think it's better to, to get what they can give to us in order to make our life easier, but not to create like they are rules just based in automatic generators. Usually they are terrible. So what we have in this case, you can see here different segments of, of code between these uh, samples. And we can see here the matches uh, between the different files. So we have three out of seven. This one is four out of seven. So okay, maybe it's not bad. Um, four out of seven, two, not really. So we don't have anything really for all the seven files, which means maybe it was not, like, this is six out of seven, this is better. This is better, five out of seven. So 
well, it doesn't matter. Um, so basically from here, we make our choosing, like which ones we believe that could be interesting. And from here, <clears throat> from here, we can create a JR rule, which will look like this. <clears throat> In this case, we will have different strings and these strings are like the different ones that we have selected. <clears throat> Sorry, but contrary to the previous error rule where we had like clear string, here is a piece of code. So we are hoping that this piece of code uh, will be enough to find some uh, real examples. So here the condition is all of them, which I think is pretty hard. Uh, maybe we can make all two of them and then we will see from the results if this is interesting or not. So basically with this, we can create a rule, uh, Yara from D, let's see that this is real, Yara from D. And, oh, sorry, and we can put the name. And there we go. So we can use this rule for monitoring like anything new that comes to virus total with this, or we can use this for a retro hand, meaning that we can search in all of our collection if this is something, if we could find more hits, for instance. So um, that's it. Uh, with this R rule, we are able to monitor everything in the past that might be related and everything in the future that this is detecting. So this is how hunting works, uh, basically in, in many cases. Uh, you have like a bunch of samples, you try to find something in common and you can use this to create some rules and you search in your whole collection. And once that you have your whole collection scanned, uh, you will see if you find something similar. And actually you can drop everything in a BT graph as we have seen, and you can keep completing like uh, the whole picture and to get like all the details. Um, the thing is that, again, these kind of rules, for me personally, are like, you know, uh, it, you will complement this. I, I will never use this rule like it is, other than for hunting. Like, let's say we want to search if this is finding something else, but until I see that what is finding is more or less solid, I will polish it a bit and maybe then we can use it. But it's great like for this first approach because finding all of this without the help of some robot like we did here uh, is almost impossible for a human being. All right, let's move on because I just want to complete that presentation. So as we said, uh, in this case, the difference is that Lighthan will simply search for anything that comes into virus total. So if it is matching anything that is uploaded, you will get a notification. And RetroHan, you will simply execute against the whole collection and see if you find anything interesting. Uh, one thing you can do for your JAR rules, and here I'm simply uh, discussing this with uh, the, the ones who are more familiar with JAR rules, is use the BP module. The BP module is helping you to use like uh, all the information, all the metadata we have in VirusTotal about some file into your YAR rule, which you can use for your retro and live hand. For instance, you want to know the submitted country, how many people submitted this. Uh, you can check like how many detections they have or what you can find inside of the signature of the detection. And even you can use these uh, behavioral traits, like if it created this mutex or if it, it dropped any file into any particular um, environment, path, whatever. So this is leveraging that we are executing everything into a sandbox. So you can use this, which you shouldn't be able to, to use regularly, but uh, in the sense that, you know, you need to have all the biosocial environment, but if you are using it, why not? This is helping you and making your life easier. Uh, basically, you can translate anything into this, into these rules. All right. So I, I just want to quickly mention the like the for most uh, advanced threat hunters. Uh, there is also an IDA plugin, and this is also making your life easier 
Uh, basically, once you install it in AIDA, uh, what you can do with that is, well, you know, now you have your sample, you can search for something very specific that you find is suspicious. And what you can do instead of blindly doing like we did with BTPIF, like finding which uh, sections of the code we want to use for our rule, we can simply uh, select by ourselves, like which parts of the code we find and interesting which parts of the code we find unique. And with the plugin, it will search inside of VirusTotal um, for anything with this content. So basically, you can very quickly find something that might be related using like some selected code. Uh, what is cool about this is that the plugin, they it will automatically kill anything that is dynamic, anything that is changing from sample to sample. Uh, for instance, if you want to search for something inside of the binary, or you want to search for the same thing, the same routine, once that this is in memory, uh, let's say you have a mem dump, uh, this is the way to do it because all the dynamic parts will be killed. So with this, you will quickly find it. So just to summarize my presentation, um, uh, I want to, I want to encourage everyone to use threat hunting uh, because this is a discipline that, you know, in the past it was associated with big investigations like APT related, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I understand we are living in a time where these APT attacks, they sound not that interesting anymore, right? But at the same time, the very same techniques are really useful and saving tons of time when we are doing some incident response forensic analysis, or simply checking the alerts in our scene. At the end of the day, we want to have context. And nowadays, we have many tools that are going to make our uh, threat hunting experience much easier. For instance, well, I, I don't know, a few years ago, who was having all these similarity tools or all these visualization tools to just drop uh, the samples and to find all the relationships? It was much harder, and these days, this is something you can leverage for your advantage or creating these jar rules almost automatically, finding all this BTBF stuff or simply having this big database you can search inside all the content. This is basically helping to all the researchers and having this possibility, once that you have all these tools, uh, this is basically changing how you can uh, leverage all this threat hunting process because now you can use it also for monitoring uh, and just keep an eye in any uh, evolution that any of the campaign sets that you're interested are doing. So you can prevent them to surprise you. You can be on top of any activity and make sure that you are ready for that. Uh, anyways, these are just a few ideas. Um, I hope this was more or less useful that you saw like different techniques that can be leveraged nowadays and how they can be used in your threat hunting. Obviously for time limitations, we were just scratching the surface, but I hope the ideas uh, remain and I hope this will be useful for all of you to improve your threat hunting capabilities. So that will be everything from my side. Uh, you have here my contact information if you need anything uh, additionally. And once again, I, I want to say thank you for the organizers for giving me the opportunity uh, to share some time with you. Thank you for time. Uh, and I'm really happy to join our first uh, workshop in our region.